to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of masculine spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. And soup up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now, here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. We here uh, at Deep Adventure Ministries believe that the most radical thing you can do with your life is abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. There can be nothing more thrilling than uh, an encounter with the living God, the one who made uh, quasars, the one who made our, our, our solar system, the one who made Tyrannosaurus Rex with big teeth and little feet, little, I mean, little arms and big feet, uh, the one who calls us to intimacy with him. And uh, so we're here today to talk with uh, Father John Mossy, who I met at the Napa Institute this last summer. We had a real, we had a good cigar together, which we'll talk about. But um, he is a Jesuit priest, and my, my, my father always was so impressed with the mind of the Jesuit. He always wanted me to be trained by the Jesuits. He said, when he's in a business conversation or when he's at meetings, when he's speaking to someone who's been trained by the Jesuits, he said, I can pick him out in a heartbeat. My dad was a superintendent of schools, so he knew a little bit, of, a little bit about education. So uh, we have Father John Mossy here with us, and we're going to talk about his, his personal uh, uh, story of conversion and vocation and uh, what, how we can come to learn to discern what God's vocation is for us. So thank you, Father John, for being with us. It's my pleasure to be on your program. And uh, thank you, Bear, and uh, Deep Adventures, and uh, and the Eternal uh, uh, Television Network uh, for hosting uh, this program. Well, yeah, was it a pleasure spending the last hour and ten minutes trying to get our our connection right? <laughs> we 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 show this on YouTube too for those who would want to go to our YouTube channel. And uh, how long would you say we just spent trying to figure out how to make our videos, voice, everything work together? It, it, it seems uh, at least an hour and a half. I, it <laughs> could have been could have been shorter, but uh, it's I'm not that patient of a person. So, uh, but I know this is important. So I we're we're both willing to make it work. Well, if I go to confession afterwards with you, can I use this as my penance that last hour? <laughs> and it, it will be my penance as well. <laughs> <laughs> but we got it working thanks to our you know our producers. So uh, we're, here we are. Now you were you were. Uh, Right now, you're 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 a Jesuit at what what location are you in? Uh, I uh, I'm at uh, Sacred Heart Jesuit Center in uh, Los Gatos, California, and uh, this is I work in uh, for Jesuits West Province in the Advancement Office, and uh, part of my uh, job is to help uh, the my colleagues in the office fundraise for our Jesuit seminarians as well as our senior and infirm Jesuits who have served many, many years in the vineyard of the Lord. Well, you know, if, if you've been, if you don't know where Los Gatos is, as a kid, I lived down below Los Gatos. I was probably 35 miles from you, maybe. I was down in the Santa Cruz, uh, Monterey Bay area, down past Santa Cruz towards Aptos. And Los Gatos was always that big hill in the distance, you know, that seemed to be going on forever. But you were actually raised... You were raised in the Bay Area, but you were raised in San Francisco. So what, what was that like as a kid? Oh, uh, for me, uh, growing up in San Francisco uh, was one huge playground. I, I liked to go fishing, so I was always uh, fishing for whatever I could catch uh, in San Francisco Bay. Uh, I even had a very small dinghy, a, a, a sailboat. I would go uh, sailing in San Francisco Bay. Oftentimes I'd go out way too far and I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful. I never got capsized or drowned or anything like that. And then my favorite activity was to go, uh, biking all, uh, all around the city to aquatic park. Uh, I considered the Presidio to be my own, uh, you know, private playground. I knew all the back roads and whatnot. And it was just fun to, uh, bicycle through that or take trips over to Golden Gate Park and go to the aquarium or uh, the planetarium. Things were just, everything was an adventure. Everything was exciting. Well, or, it is. Or to bike, 
Pardon me? It is there. I mean, it's not like Mayberry RFD. That's, I mean, you, you would pedal across the Golden Gate Bridge, right? Yeah, we'd, we'd make trips into Sausalito, San Rafael, and uh, there were always exciting, uh, you know, uh, adventures. And, uh, and of course, I, I don't think, uh, you know, if, if our parents knew some of the crazy things that we were doing, they, we, they wouldn't have allowed us to do it. But we did it. We were kids. And we just, we had to make, we didn't have any of the technological things that, you know, kids spend. So we had to use our own imagination, you know, make up our own games and own adventures and fun time, which but we did. But bi bicycling in San Francisco, because I remember once driving a stick shift in San Francisco, <laughs> like the worst idea possible. You're on the steepest possible hill and you got to put the brake on and shift gears and clutch. You know, when you stopped, and you and and there's a car right behind you, a six inches behind you, and you got to somehow get it in gear and pull out before the trolley runs over you. Or, I mean, that's I can't imagine you bicycling on the on those roads. That going down would have well, been fun. Well, those would be the hills we, yeah, those are the hills we went down. Uh, we took other hills were which were not as steep uh, to navigate to get up to that point. And then it was you know see how fast we could get down the hill with, you know, without, you know, killing oneself. No skateboarding, so, no skateboarding uh, then? The skateboarding was not, no, that was not, uh, that wasn't even known at that time. I think when I was a kid uh, going to the Bay Area, we had two by fours with skates on that we, we nailed into them. And then that was sidewalk surfing. And then gradually we got, you know, more official, but very deadly <laughs> skateboards with the metal yes. wheels. Did you ever bicycle down Lombard? Is that the street that's the windy street going down? San that Francisco. is the windy street. I don't have a recollection of doing it, uh, which I can't exclude it. But, uh, you know, a trip over to Fort Mason uh, and Aquatic Park or down into Fisherman's Wharf, we, we were because there were some museums there. There was a, uh, you know, a, a nautical museum. And, uh, and then they also had, uh, you know, uh, historic ships and things like that. So we would go, you know, that's part of the adventure. And we would go explore those, and uh, it was always fun. Did you ever pedal across the Golden Gate Bridge when there was a heavy fog? Uh, most likely, yes. Yeah, that, that fog, being a San Franciscan, that doesn't deter you in the least from doing what you need to do. I mean, you, you, could, just, you, know, you, would, you would be able to do it. And, you could hear the uh, foghorns in the – I mean, you might not even be able to see your hand almost. I mean, it's not that bad, but pretty much – but you hear that eerie sound of the foghorn in the distance and, you know, you lose that right. sense of time and space. Well, I grew up with hearing foghorns and uh, one even had the name of Big Bertha. And that one was, you know, that one had a distinct sound and it was all part of the, you know, colorful atmosphere of San Francisco. Well, so you lived a very, uh, I mean, really, I can't, you know, I was raised in Santa Cruz, so not very far from you. Uh, it was all about surfing for me and the beach and the red, of course, the redwood trees where you are in Las Gatas and in the San Francisco area is so beautiful. But San Francisco, I, I, that would have been, a, being on, oh, on the other side of the bay, maybe not, or down by um, uh, San Jose, maybe not. But San Francisco itself is just, I mean, it, you would be imagining pirates and, and all kinds of adventures going on there. I, I would have had a good time there. But what kind of fish would you catch? Oh, well, if we caught, you know, a uh, perch, they were usually small white type of fish. And uh, whether, you know, I can't recall if, uh, you know, taking them home and eating them, but they were just kind of the, you know, the, the prize and the, the, the thrill of finding out, you know, what was there and what can we do? The and, thrill of the uh, bite, of the bite, right? Did you have to ever yeah, have to fight a seal for your fish? You no, ever try to steal no, it? It's, no, the, the only thing, the only major problem was seagulls, you know, uh, ah. kind of going, trying to steal your bait or things like that. They could get a little aggressive at times, but you just deal with it and, uh, you know, move on. Well, now, San Francisco, to me, I think of Italian. You're not Italian, are you? Which, which uh, is Mossy, Mossy is Swiss Italian. Oh, so, oh uh, really? We're from uh, the, the Mossies are from the northern part of uh of Italy, the part that, you know, connects with Switzerland and uh, from the canton of Tencino. Uh, and there's a little town called Giabasco, and um, I've never been to it, but that's where I understand my great-grandfather and uh, the Mossies came.
painful. Well, we're talking with Father John Mossy, a Jesuit priest uh, who we got to know at Napa Institute over a couple of cigars. And I really enjoyed his company. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about his adventures as they got more interested as he uh, pursued his vocation as a priest. And we're going to kind of unpack that whole thing of what, how, how you can discern what God's will is for your life, if he's calling you to the priesthood or not. This is Bear Wozniak. Um, I want to invite you to go to deepadventure.com. You can uh, join Bear's Man Cave. Uh, you, it's a private Facebook group. You can't join it by finding it on Facebook. You have to go to my website, deepadventure.com. And then you become a part of a men's group. We get together every two or three weeks over live Zoom video chat where we can all see each other and talk with each other. And right now we're reading through one of my books, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. But in that fi private Facebook group, we challenge each other, we equip each other, we, we immobilize each other. It's just a great way to show what a, men's, a small men's group can be. And then we challenge our men to go out and start their own. So uh, please go to deepadventure.com and check it out. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha, and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. I need to thank uh, my two great sponsors, Solidarity Health, uh, an alternative to regular insurance uh, for Catholics. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great, great company. Some of my family members use that as their, as their means of, of having health care, and uh, we love them. They're, just, they're great people. I've been wanting them to be my sponsor for a long time. We finally connected, and I just really love them as an organization. Love Brad Hahn, one of the founders, and all the commitment that they, they uh, have to uh, Catholic values, Catholic morals, Catholic teaching, the magisterium of the church. And then we have Notre Dame Federal Credit Union. They are they're amazing. I, I bought a used car out in Hawaii, and I didn't think I could get funded by a, a Notre Dame Federal Credit Union on the mainland because it's really hard. There's only a, Mostly in Hawaii, it's mostly just local banks. But they actually, um, um, I worked... I, I, they'd already said they wanted to sponsor me, but I wanted to check it out. So I worked with someone who had no idea that I was friends with the CEO, and this woman just did a great job getting me my loan, and so I have utmost confidence in recommending them to you. And you can go to deepadventure.com and, 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 and click on the links there and go, go visit their site. So we're so appreciative because they're the ones, along with your donations, that bring us to you. So we have as our guest today Father John Mossy. Now, we've got to get into the, the grit of our subject, but first I've got to ask you one more question. Um, we met over cigars. That's right at Napa Institute. And did you did you enjoy the cigars? I well, yes, I, I enjoyed the cigar that night, and I uh, you generously gave me a, a few more to take home with me, which I have smoked. Not to say that I, you know, I smoke that often. I don't, but on occasion, uh, uh, I like to light up a cigar with a good friend, have a conversation, and you know, I feel like a million bucks. You know, it's like, it's something, you know, I have in my little man cave, it's really my lanai out here overlooking the ocean, but there's a little corner that I've carved out and there's a picture of G.K. Chesterton who someday will be the patron saint of cigars, I think. But, but there was something about the, the manliness of us. Uh, we, we, for sure, when we were having our cigars, women ran for cover. <laughs> they don't like the, the smoke. It, to me, it's a solidarity maker. I mean, a, 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 a right. solitude maker. I sit out on the beach and have a cigar. No one's going to come talk to me or, or, or be around me. And it's just a great, I, my prayer life has been extended greatly by cigars. I have to tell you, it's, you know, my time of studying and reading, it's just, just beautiful. And I recently got my dad hooked on cigars and it's, he's 90. So I'm afraid it's going to stunt his growth, you know, but it was well, such a pleasure. Only, yeah. The only one who will come and approach you if you're smoking a cigar is a fellow cigar smoker. That's right. And so that will be, there will be a, a, a commonality there and an attraction. And, uh, you know, it's not like uh, smoking a cigarette, uh, you know, you're, you're done in five minutes. You have to nurture that. It, uh, a cigar is a commitment. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're in, in it for an hour. Right. And it's a, and it's a mini vacation, too. Uh, and, you know, by the way, I just recently got my blood tested, zero nicotine. You know, cigars really don't have nicotine, uh, any, any amount to speak of. But they're just a great way to have fellowship. In fact, my cigars, the, the deep, the uh, seven virtue cigar samplers that we have at our website, you know, they have those, there's seven, there's a different blend for each of the virtues. And when you unpeel that label, it, it invites people to have a discussion about something deeper. 
But yeah, and that's where we got to know each other was over a cigar. So I'm so glad we did. But I want to ask you now, there's this adventurous kid in San Francisco. How did you, how did they wrangle you into becoming a priest then, Father? How did that all happen? Well, nobody, nobody actually wrangled me. The Holy Spirit did, I bet. Well, I won't, I won't even go, I won't go that far. <laughs> okay. But, and uh, what I'm going to say, I don't really share with that many people, but I know this is going out in media, so it is going to be shared. But, um, and I'm trying to find the right word, but I would say I had uh, an inkling. Uh, and now it's nothing uh, for sure in concrete, but uh Either, it was either a, a soft voice or um, an invitation, a very gentle, quiet invitation to be a priest. And I detected this at seven years old. And um, now, you know, you might say, oh, my gosh, no, uh, geez, the angel Gabriel appeared to, you know, Father John Mossy, you know, and it's kind of set for life. No, it was not like that. You know, I, I had, uh, you know, my usual obnoxious uh, childhood that most, uh, you know, kids go through and made plenty of mistakes and, uh, you know, did all the kind of the wrong and stupid things that kids do. And, but this inkling or voice or nudge. Uh, I think nudge was, is a good word. Nudge is a good well, word. Okay. All right. Well, I'm looking for the right word. I use know, that word a lot. Nothing, well, it was a nudge, you know, uh to you know to be a priest and and if this was not a slam dunk uh dunk thing uh i said well okay and as much as i tried to shake it off uh it wouldn't go away so uh anything you know the hound of heaven uh was mm -hmm. there and this was true through uh certainly through grammar school and uh at one time uh i I, I said to uh, the family, I wanted to enter. At that time, there were minor seminaries. There were high school seminaries. And uh, I said, I would like to do that. And the, there was a family discussion, and I was outvoted. And uh, so they, they, the point was at that time that if it really is true, uh, they would give you know, permission after high school. So I sat back, and I said, okay, well, if it is true, if it's true now, and if it's really true, it'll be true in four years. So I was content, uh, content uh, you know, with the agreement. And once again, I, I was uh, I had a normal, you know, high school experience. I was uh, in a lot of drama and, and plays and things like that. And uh, and uh, did the went to dances and uh, football games and and basketball games and. All the crazy things that you know high school students do at, at least at that time and uh it was still persistent so i said well i gotta check it out and uh and see if the shoe fits and that's the kind of the analogy um uh, i use it wasn't that i was 100 percent sure totally sure or you know i had received uh, you know a letter from god saying hey john you are to be a priest and, uh, and at that time, I was really glad I delayed uh, 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 going uh, into the seminary after high school because I went to St. Ignatius High School uh, in San Francisco. And there is where I encountered the Jesuits. And I said, oh, my gosh, these guys are having a lot of fun. And I could identify or see myself uh, both as a priest, as a Jesuit priest, but something also I wanted to do was teach. And so what do Jesuits do? Well, uh, besides being missionaries, uh, they're also, uh, we're also educators. And I said, well, this is, uh, this is combining two, two directions I think I'm moving in life. So I entered the Jesuit novitiate uh, in 1962. And uh, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, the fellow novices I was with, and I was at peace. And uh, I said, I feel that I was doing the right thing. And uh, so it took me uh, 10 years to be ordained. I was ordained uh, in 1973 at uh, St. Mary's Cathedral in San Francisco. And uh, since then, I've served a whole uh, a number of ministries. Uh, 
Uh, I was a parish priest at Our Lady of Sorrows Parish in Santa Barbara for five years. And then I came to Los Altos, California, which is near Los Gatos, but oftentimes they get confused. And uh, I served at the Jesuit Retreat Center of Los Altos, also known as El Retiro. And uh, I was there for a period of seven years. And during that time, there was a three-year hiatus where I went to Catholic University of America in DC and I acquired a doctorate of ministry degree. And that was a big ticket for me because I did return to giving retreats, but then I started teaching again. And I really enjoyed it. I said, you know, I, I felt more, even though I enjoyed doing spiritual direction and giving retreats, uh, I said, I really enjoyed the classroom dynamic so in 1991, I went to Spokane, Washington, and for 16 years, I taught at Gonzaga University, oh. uh, the home of the Bulldogs, in Spokane, Washington. And the, the three courses I taught were Catholicism, Christian spirituality, and Introduction to Pastoral Counseling. We have, to take, a, there. We, we have to take a, a, a break here, Father. I always, it's, okay. hard, it's hard to, have, to cut off a priest when he's talking, but... We're talking with Father John Mossy. We're talking about his personal experience of his call and his mission, and as a way of discovering and, and opening up the, the 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 thought is God also giving you a nudge to become a priest. This is Bear Wozniak on the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We'll be right back. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I remember walking into EWTN Studios the first time, and I saw that picture of Mother Angelica. It's a big portrait there in the uh, reception area. And she has that mischievous look, like she knows something you don't know, and that you're in for it. Yeah, God's up to something. And I've talked to so many people who say that, that started a radio station who had never even been in radio or so many different areas. Of, they, they might have, they've been excellent in other areas, and so God called them to uh, re, recreate uh, their path. And I, they all say the same thing. I kind of felt this nudge from the Holy Spirit. And earlier, Father John was talking about uh, how it was that he experienced that calling. Was it an inkling? Was it a drawing? And then finally, I was waiting for him to say the word nudge. Sometimes it's like a big shove, but sometimes it's just a little little tap on the shoulder from the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you got him in it, and then you're in, then you're in for it. It reminds me of uh, the old Charlie Chaplin, a little two-minute uh, show where he's standing by a, a railroad car, railroad uh, track, and a railroad, ra railroad train comes by, and he lets his umbrella kind of hang out a little bit too far. Next thing you know, the, he's caught the train, or the train's got him, and he's, in, he's on, for, on for a rural end of a ride. And um, I think that's, that's, the, that's the way of the Holy Spirit. There's, there's that time in our life when we take a detour, and that's when the adventure begins. We're talking with Father John Mossy, who we met at the Napa Institute. He's a Jesuit uh, in, responsible for the, in the advancement area, uh, especially helping the seminarians uh, getting funded so they can do their training. But you, Father John, you said it was 10 years of training before you became a priest. That's correct, yes. Uh, what, what tells uh, That's because uh, Jesuits are slow learners. Well, yeah, it is true, because I was asking Father... Mitch Packwell once, because, you know, I have, I love to study, and I was, I went into his library, you know, to his home. Have you been to his home? Where it's, it's, it's just basically all books. And I said, Father Mitch, how do you remember so much? And he goes, I just read, an, I read uh, on the same subject, 10 different books. Repetition, right? Isn't that part of the Jesuit way? Uh, so, yeah, slow learners. Yes, <laughs> repetitio es mater studiorum. Yes, repetition is the mother of learning, because when you would teach, you would tell them, okay, this is what you're going to learn. Then you would teach it, and then you would remind them what you had just learned. So you have to do it at least three times, and it might sink in. And, you know, don't put any money on it either because but it takes a long time. As an athlete, I know when I when I train my body to do certain things, whether it's martial arts or surfing or whatever, um, it, it's repetition. 10,000 times is, is— It's absolutely—yes, yes. yes. And, and like right now, I'm studying the life of St. Paul. I've read— 
a dozen books. I've got a dozen more sitting in my 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 in my reading stack, and it's finally starting to sink in. You know what his life is. So, but tell us about that. Uh, what the training is that you go through as a Jesuit usually? Well, uh, the the training starts out with uh, the novitiate, which really is a school of prayer, learning how to pray. And uh, I would say that you know, uh, prior to entering the novitiate, I had done certain devotions, or I was attracted to the mass. I, I have to say that the uh, the Eucharist, and at that time it was the Latin mass. Uh, I was attracted to the mystery of the mass, and uh, and the fact that Jesus was really present, and uh, and 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 even to this day, uh, to celebrate the Eucharist is a great experience of joy for me. Wow! And I know that's a, that is a gift of God. That's not. It's not. Has nothing to do. You know, with my holiness or you know anything, uh, mm-hmm. anything on my part, I totally attribute that to God. What so, was it like I, the first time you celebrated Mass? Let me ask you, what was that like? Well, there was. I know there was great joy, but uh, I didn't really start. I'm going to use the word praying the Mass versus saying the Mass or celebrating the Mass, but to pray the Mass. So I was. When you when and I'm using that word pray the mass is that I'm not thinking about the rubrics I know the text and uh, what is taking place I am in sync I'm in union mm. or in communion with mm. what is taking place now mm. that does not come with your first mass unless you're an extraordinary saint I'm not that that only took place I say maybe a year after uh, of s- celebrating the mass, and 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 initially, I would say I said the mass, but then mm. to get to the point where you understand what each movement and each word and each prayer that mm. is being said really means, mm. and how you are transcending the moment of mm. and really becoming everyone present there, the mm. body of Christ. And that is, that's a grace. And, and, and when that is taking place, you're just an instrument. You're not in charge. I'm not in charge. Mm. This, is, this is, you know, God's mm. action and the mystery of the Trinity, you know, embracing our humanity and, uh, and speaking to us in, in all different types of, uh, of forms. And, you know, in actions, in readings, in gestures, in symbols, in candles, and in incense, all this as we as we try to we try to encapture the holy, and uh, and that that is, is that is always a great grace, and it's very humble. Here at uh, Sacred Heart Jesuit Center, I take my uh, celebrate for the retired and infirm Jesuits here. And this is always, always humbled, greatly humbled by this experience. Here I am, uh, here, or brothers, uh, but the, the priests, uh, ordained priests, would love to be celebrating Mass, but they either don't have the physical strength to stand, or they don't have the memory to know the whole order of the mass, it would get lost or confused or just stop midway, uh, and and yet they are are present. Uh, they and I am, you know, it is my turn as others have done for me to give the gift of God's love and intimacy in the Eucharist. You know, I remember um, recently. I'm, I'm an oblate with the Benedictine monastery up in the North Shore of Oahu. I've known them for. 30 years or maybe 40, I think. Yeah, a long time, over 40 years. Um, from They were came from Pecos, New Mexico, the, the Charismatic Benedictines. And uh, Father Michael, who I knew when he was a brother, uh, and it, it meant so much to me, he, he, he's older now. And he's celebrating Mass. And he's giving his homily. And he turned it into, he loves the Lord so much 
that he's talking to us. And then gradually it just became a St. Augustine thing where he, he was talking to God. It became a yeah. prayer. He, the the 15, 10, 15 minutes of his homily was just a prayer to God. I think he almost forgot where he was. You know, so beautiful. But what a privilege to, to be able to say the Mass uh, through all these years and then to say the Mass with these, these, these men who have served so much. But I want to ask you, the first stage of your training then, you said, was the, the spiritual training. Uh, the novitiate, right. and then, then, and then what? What happens? Well, uh, then we get academic training. So we are exposed to philosophy and different philosophies, not just Catholic philosophies, but uh, Greek, ancient, modern philosophies. And um, uh, so we call that now first studies, and it, that is usually depending on what type of academic background you bring. Some men come in with uh, doctorates or masters, so they might not, they would not need uh, as many years, but usually that's three years of what we call first studies but, of, yep. uh, a, and with an emphasis on, on uh, philosophy. But, but, Father John, your... but Father John, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Uh, everything, because uh, you know, uh, the, uh, and that's the mystery of the incarnation uh, of, you know, the divine entering humanity. And, you know, uh, the, the whole Jesuit spirituality is to find God in all things, all cultures, all experiences, all peoples. And so we have this intensity, this intense curiosity to uh, where is God you know, in this truth, in this wisdom, uh, and and how can we elevate it? So our job. I, I got to uh, interrupt you, Father. Is, I got to interrupt you. We're gonna, but let's hold it right okay. there. Let's come back to that. Uh, we're talking with Father John Mossy, a Jesuit, and my father always said, when you find a Jesuit, grab onto him. He can always point out a, a Jesuit priest or someone who's been trained by the Jesuits because of the the way they think and their ability to reason. Father John and I met at Napa Institute, and he's. Um, and, and uh, over a cigar. And, uh, and he's uh, up in Los Gatos now uh, working with the, the seminarians there. And uh, we're, uh, gonna, we're talking a little bit more about vocations and how you get the nudge. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We'll be right back. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Uh, just before we broke on this segment, if you could be watching this on YouTube, which we have, a, it's available at the Bear Wozniak channel on YouTube. When I asked Father this last, made this last point with Father John, his whole physicality just changed. <laughs> he lit up. When I asked him that question, who was it that asked it? Was it, was it um, Jerome that asked it? What does Athens have to do with Rome? You know, I'm having a senior moment right now. I think now, it was. I think so it might have been. I, I, but what, what, is, what does Aristotle and Socrates have to do with uh with the Gospels? I mean, why do we have to study philosophy? Well, th this is, uh, as I was saying, the, the whole curiosity of uh, finding God in all cultures, all experiences, all systems and frameworks, and, uh, uh, and how do we act as leaven to raise those philosophies and, and systems up to encounter the good news of the gospel and the person of Jesus Christ. So that's a, we're uh, uh, we're all evangelists, and uh, that is um, you know our mission, and to uh, not to cause you know a, a black and white division, but how do we go in their door to bring them to you know the gift and grace of the gospel? You know you see uh, Augustine's love for for Plato and. Thomas Aquinas' love for Aristotle. I think it's the book, uh, The One and the Many. Are you familiar with that book by, or I think it's Ortiz? No, I'm not. It's a, just a great, it's a great kind of uh, beginning point. Uh, and uh, Peter Kraft is always so good at explaining things to me, you know, when, on his, uh, his lectures and his books, sent, dumbing down philosophy enough so where I can understand it. But uh, there is such a, there's such a beautiful statement that Catholics make when they train their priests in philosophy. Because it recognizes that we have a spiritual, rational soul, 
yeah. that God wants us to think faith seeking understanding. Yeah, and that's St. Anselm, and, uh, and that's a classic definition. And so uh, Catholicism is, is forever curious about creation and about humanity. And it doesn't, it doesn't ignore it, it engages it, and it elevates it. And, uh, and, and that's, our, that's our missionary task. And your, and your strategy. Yes, you know, it's your right. approach. The the, uh, you know, uh, I forget if it was John Paul II. I don't know where I read it, but you know, the the whole thing about how in Hawaii, when the Puritans came over, the, the the I don't know what they were, the Protestants that came over, evangelized Hawaii, no more surfing, no more speaking Hawaiian, no more grass skirts, no more. Ho yeah, they just kind of like shut down the whole culture, where the ho where the word culture comes from, the word cult, you know, religion. And that there's that there is that welling up that 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 by uh, within us that upward yearning within us that uh, is expressed in culture. And so your curiosity about culture as a Jesuit, how can we learn from that? How can we kind of raise that up to be to bring it more fully to life? And of course, where people are being sacrificed, <laughs> leave leave things behind. But the appreciation that it, in the heart of man, every culture has its truth, but we want to bring them to the purest form of the truth. Yes. And so the beauty of philosophy. You know, what? Yeah. You were asking about, you know, the um, uh, being nudged all through this um, and uh, vocation. I, I, I hope I'm not shifting it, but Go for this it. is something uh, I, if anything, I'd like to share with anyone who might feel a vocation to religious life to the sisterhood, to the brotherhood, uh, to the priesthood, whether it's in a community, like you were saying, the Benedictines or the Jesuits or the Dominicans or the Franciscans, or to diocesan uh, service, which is a very heroic service as a diocesan priest. If you have that, if you have that nudge or that quiet voice or that, that this, this tape keeps coming back and playing, I just wanna say to you, follow it and be true to it. You it will never, I, I do not feel in any way diminished uh, as a Jesuit priest. Uh, actually, I know I've been enriched uh, through uh, not only my education, for which I'm very, very grateful for, but I've been enriched by the people I've met, uh, by the uh, faith and trust uh, and very uh, intimate and private, you know, experiences that people have shared with me on their life journey. And it's very, it's very humbling, you know, to hear these things. I know that my life has only been enriched by saying yes to this mysterious call and it's still unfolding. So it's not like, you know, you get it figured out and you put it in a neat box. Oh no, no. Uh, each day, uh, you know, is an invitation to go deeper into this, you know, exciting pilgrimage that God is extending to us through ministry and through service and through the church. And that is real. I, 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 uh, and however that takes place, and if it's a nudge, a, a tweaking, mm -hmm. uh, a silent voice, whatever it is, follow it. And see where it, and see where it leads, because you know, it's like sometimes. You feel a nudge, and you and you and you kind of you kind of get you put in motion, and you realize, well, that's not quite what it was, but it's this, you know. Right. I, I, but 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 being in motion, following what you trying to follow the Holy Spirit, then God can direct your path. It's really I remember the old days we had the cars without power steering. You couldn't turn the wheel of that car until the car was moving. Right. Same with the Lord, right. as you begin to move, and trying to respond to His will, God can more clearly direct you. And what, what, what greater gift would it be to uh, if, if one or two people listening to the show would respond to your voice, Father, and, and, and say, well, I'm at least going to explore what it would be to be a priest. Well, I hope it's more than one or two. <laughs> yes. Because, I mean, there is such a, a great need for competent, pastoral, uh, caring priests and dedicated and committed priests in the world today. And, uh, and, uh, I, I cannot encourage, uh, you know, 
uh, young men or anyone to, you know, enter into uh, the ministry of service. It's, it's very, very important. It's being on the front lines. Yes, it is. And, uh, you know, and it's, it's a way of, of service. Uh, at one time, you know, we had a very strong vocation culture. I would like to see that come back uh, and to promote vocations. So talk to and, the parent. Talk to the parents, Father, right now. Well, you know, uh, you know, people say to me, uh, geez, we really love Jesuit vocation. And, uh, and I say, well, if you like Jesuit vocations, you know, guess what? Where do Jesuits come from? They come from families, ordinary families. And if you have uh, three sons, would you like to have one of your sons be a Jesuit priest? This is what it takes. It comes from the family. So there's going to have to be this element of sacrifice. And I know when uh, it was time for me to enter the novitiate, you know, my mom was really not, you know, real, she was not in favor of it. She wanted to, you know, experience my grandchildren so she could, or my uh, children, so yeah. she could be a grandmother and hold, you know, her grandchildren. Well, that was not, that's not going to happen. Uh, but eventually she came around because she said I was happy and she, she you know, met my uh, wonderful classmates and friends and, uh, and she could see how this life was unfolding. But if you want, if you want priests, you have to, families have to sacrifice uh, for them and that comes from your children. You know, one of the and, things, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Father. No, 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 go ahead, you go. I mean, when we were, the last guest I interviewed, you know, I always challenge men, if you're not praying the rosary every day, uh, slaying dragons for your family before they even get up, then you're basically a, a, a poser, you know. But, but then this woman I was interviewing, Christine Watkins, said, yes, and also pray the rosary with your children. So while you men lead the rosary, and while you're praying the rosary, Pray for vocations and help your children understand what that is. We're talking with yes. Father John you know, Mossy. We only have about a, 30 seconds left. So, Father, I've neglected to tell people how they could find you, how they could reach out to you. Well, the best way is uh, email. And here's my email. It's jmossi, J-M-O-S-S-I, at Jesuits, J-E-S-U-I-T-S dot org. So if you want, if you'd like to reach out to Father and learn a little bit, maybe you're thinking maybe I should find out a little bit about a vocation, uh, any vo any vocation or a vocation with the Jesuits specifically. This is your chance, Father. Thanks for uh, spending that first hour with us trying to work on the technical difficulties, and then this last hour, uh, you know, it's always worth it, isn't it, to persevere? It is. <laughs> and we need to invite everybody. I always forget. Go to our website, deepadventure.com. You can subscribe to our newsletter, and if you do that you will get this radio show sent to you in video format because we, we, uh, we stream this and it's up on YouTube also at the Bear Wozniak channel. We actually send it to you so you can send it, you, uh, you evangelist moms, you can send it to your sons in college and your brother-in-laws and, uh, and, and men, you can share it with, uh, with the men in your lives. Thank you, Father John, for joining us. Thank you, Bear, very much. I really appreciate this opportunity. At, well, as we say here, may the breath of the Holy Spirit Aloha, you. Aloha. Okay, so now Aloha. I have... You've been listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Go to bearwozniak.com to get your free audio and other exciting content. Plus, you can pick up the Long Ride Home 10-episode DVD set, autographed copies of Bear's books, Long Ride Home shirts, tanks, coffee cups, and even motorcycle pins and patches. And find out how guys can sign up for Bear's Man Cave online Facebook group, all at bearwozniak.com.